In this lecture, we'll look a little closer at the use of linear models. And we'll start in this first video with linear regression. The use of linear models to perform regression tasks. In the last lecture, we saw the basic recipe of offline machine learning, which looked like this. We abstract our problem to a standard task by choosing their instances and their features. We choose our model class and we search for a good model within that model class. We'll focus in this lecture on the last two points, specifically on the model class of linear models. And we'll look for a large part of the lecture at the different ways we have in general of searching for a good model within a model class. And a lot of the search methods that we see here today are not just applicable for linear models, but are applicable to a lot of models in general. And we'll start with the abstract task of regression, which we also saw in the last lecture. In regression, our data consists of a table of instances together with their features and one single target value that we have to predict for each instance. We feed that to a learner, the learner produces a model, and for a new instance, the model produces a prediction of what the target value might be. And the practical example we saw in the last lecture looked like this. For a large population of people, we measure their height as a single feature and the length of their legs as a target value. And if we plot that data, it looks like this cloud of points. And in this space, and a line in this space is one way to predict an output value for every instance. In this lecture, we'll follow basically the same idea, except that we'll simplify our uh, example data a little bit. For the rest of the lecture, we will focus on, these, on this example data set of six points, but anything we discuss can be generalized to data sets with more points and with more features per point. We'll start by setting up a little bit of notation that we'll try and stick to throughout the course. Whenever we use a lowercase non-bold letter, that refers to a scalar. That is, it refers to a single number. Whenever we use a bold-faced lowercase letter, that refers to a vector, that is a column of numbers. And when we use an uppercase bold-faced letter, that refers to a matrix, a rectangular grid of numbers. We'll use subscripts to refer to the elements of these vectors and matrices. So the ith element of a vector x, we will refer to as x subscript i. And since that element is a scalar, the subscripted version uh, will be non-bolded. And the same goes for the matrix. So in this notation, we can very neatly express our data set for a regression task in the following way. We have a list of instances, and each instance consists of a number of features, a fixed number for the whole data set, in this case, m. So each of these instances we can represent by a vector. And all the elements of the vector represent our m measurements of this particular instance. And the target value t can simply rep be represented as a sequence of scalar values. There's a little bit of uh, ambiguity here. Note that when we have a bold-faced letter x subscripted by i, it refers to the whole instance i in the data. And if we have a lowercase x with an index that refers to the feature j of some instance that hasn't been specified. We can do this because it's very rare that we need to specify both which instance we're talking about and which feature of that instance we're talking about. If that does happen, we will usually see the data as a large matrix X, and we will usually refer to feature j of instance i by indexing this data matrix instead of the instance vector. But as I say, uh, this is hopefully a rare occurrence. So with this notation in place, we can now define what our regression model looks like. And to keep things simple, we'll start with a data set of one feature per instance. In that case, as we saw in the uh, previous pictures, a linear model forms simply a line, and a line can be defined in this way. We have a function which consists of two constants, two parameters, w and b, where w is multiplied by the value of the feature, and to that we add b. Here we call w the weight and b the bias. w is also sometimes called a coefficient, and b is also sometimes called an intercept, but we'll stick with weights and biases. And the line that is defined by this function, the value w is also known as the slope, tells us how much the line goes up if we take one step to the right, 
and the value b shifts the whole line up and down. To extend this principle to more than one feature, we simply add another parameter. So in the two feature case, we now have two weights, w1 and w2, and still one bias. The first weight is multiplied by the first feature, and the second weight is multiplied by the second feature, and the bias is added on the end. Here's what that looks like. The thick orange lines together indicate a plane, which rises in the x2 direction and declines in the x1 direction. And the value w1 indicates how much f increases if we take a step of 1 along the x1 axis. The value of w2 indicates how much f increases if we take a step of size 1 along the x2 axis. Note that f decreases along the x1 axis, so w1 must be negative in this case. The value b, finally, serves to translate the whole hyperplane up or down. If we have more than two features, we extend the function in the same way. For every feature, we introduce a weight, and the function is computed by multiplying each weight by its corresponding feature, and summing all of these multiplications together, and adding b on the end. And since we have one weight for every feature, we combine these in a vector w, which has the same length as our feature vector x. We can then summarize the computation of this function f by using a dot product. The b stays in place, but the rest of the sum can be expressed as the dot product of w and x. And the dot product is a very simple but very important function in machine learning, so let's look at that in detail. We write it in these two ways, either w followed by a superscript tx or w centered dot x. We'll use the superscript t notation mostly in this course. Note that this is not a special operator. It arises from the fact that if we make one vector a row vector, and one, one vector a column vector, and matrix multiply them, then the result is the dot product. And the dot product of two vectors of equal length is computed very simply by matching up the elements, multiplying them together, and summing up the result. One important property of the dot product is that it can also be defined like this. We take the magnitude of both vectors, w and x, and we multiply it by the angle between the two vectors in space, alpha. We won't explain where this correspondence comes from, but occasionally we will use it, so it's important to know. To build a little intuition for how this dot product operates, let's look at an example. Imagine we are predicting high blood pressure in patients. So the instances are different patients, and the features we measure are job stress, the health of their diet, and their age. And each of these we will capture in an appropriate number. If we build a linear regression model to predict the probability that a particular patient has high blood pressure based on these three factors, the computation looks a little bit like this. We have three features, how stressful the job is, how healthy the diet is, and how old they are. And we have three corresponding weights that we want to learn. We've ignored the bias term here because we're just looking at the dot product. The first thing to note is how the sign of the weight operates. For some of these features, we want to learn a positive weight because more job stress contributes to a higher risk of blood pressure. For others, we want to learn a negative weight. The healthier your diet, the lower your risk of high blood pressure. And in addition to the sign, we can control the magnitude of the weights to control their relative importance. If age and job stress both contribute positively, but age is the bigger risk factor, we can make both weights positive, but make the weight for age a little bigger. And if it turns out that we've included a feature that isn't actually relevant for the task, then we can make the weight for that feature go to zero so that it doesn't contribute to the output either way. So that's how we define a linear model. But given this class of models defined in this way, how do we find the one that fits our data the best? To do that, we need two more ingredients. We need to define a loss function, which tells us how well the model fits the data, and we need to define a search method so that we can search the space of all models for the model that gives us a low loss. We'll look at the search methods in the next video and finish up this video by looking at one of the most popular loss functions for regression, namely the mean squared error loss. We've seen this already in the last lecture, but now we'll look at it in a little bit more detail and we'll try to work it into a search function. The loss function operates very simply. It compares the model output fpxj to the known value that it should be predicting. It subtracts one from the other to get the difference, then it squares the difference and takes the average over all of these squares over the whole data set. If we apply this loss function to our model, fill in what we know about our model, 
And we see that the parameters of the model are expressed by the vector w and by the single scalar b. And the computation of the model we can express by just filling in the formula that uh, expresses the model. The dot product of w with instance vector xj plus the bias term b. The difference between the model output and the known target value, the green part and the green bars in this figure here, we call the residuals. How much we need to add to or subtract from the model output to arrive at the correct answer. The loss is computed by squaring and then averaging these residuals. There are a few reasons for squaring the residuals. The first is that we don't want positive and negative residuals to cancel out in this sum, because if we have a lot of large negative residuals and an equal number of large positive residuals, that doesn't mean that our model is perfect, it means that our model is very bad. So we want to look at the absolute value of the residuals, and the squares automatically help us to do that. But there is another reason. By squaring the residuals, we are weighting the larger residuals disproportionately. We can see how that, what that looks like here. The sum of the squares is essentially the sum of all the areas in this picture, because the area of the square that we see here is the square of the size of the residual. So what you see is that the uh, largest residual on the bottom left counts much, much more towards the total loss than the rest of the residuals. Other loss functions exist, and this is just a simple one to start with. In a later lecture, we will see that this loss function follows from the assumption that the model is correct, except for added noise from a normal distribution. We should also note that there are a lot of slightly different ways of writing the squared error loss. Sometimes we take just the sum, sometimes we take the average, sometimes we add a factor of one half in front so that the derivative works out a little nicer, and sometimes we take the square root. In practice, most of these variations don't matter that much because we're not that interested in the absolute value of the loss. We're just interested in the model for which the loss is minimized. So with that, we have a functional form for our model and an expression of the loss. In the next video, we'll see how to search the space of all models for a model that gives us a low loss.